So Josh Strykowski is the writer and actor in this summer's hottest movie, Disciples in the Moonlight. I, I'm so excited about this. Josh, thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Now, this is the week that we're launching. The, you're launching this movie and I'm launching oh. this interview tonight. And so that people can get their tickets and go and see Disciples in the Moonlight. You yeah. are the writer. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what inspired this whole storyline of Disciples in the Moonlight. Sure. So kind of an interesting story. I mean, for me, it is. I mean, maybe not for everybody else. But so I in the fall of 2012, um, I was transitioning out of an old one job, moving to another. Uh, my wife was pregnant with our first son and I had, I'd gotten a phone call from a friend and he said, Hey, I'm meeting together with this group of filmmakers here on the West side of Indianapolis. And he's like, you've written some stuff, right? I said, well, I've never, never written a screenplay, but I, I write kind of on occasion. And he said, well, we need writers. Why don't you come on out? And I, so I did. And so I started hanging out with these guys for a while. And there were a lot of talented people and kind of the vision was laid out, but it came down to, they basically said, Hey, we have all these talented people, but we don't have any stories to tell. And they said, okay, so we're going to go home and brainstorm on some ideas. So one night my son is now born. I was, I can, I remember this vividly. I was sitting on my couch and when I brainstorm, I listened to music and I was listening to Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune. And it's one of my favorite classical pieces. I mean, it's a very famous popular piece. And I just started, my mind just started turning. And all of a sudden, I just had this, I just had this image in my head of people running through the cornfields here in Indiana. Um, in the fall time, you can really hear the leaves of the corn just kind of rustling together when the wind blows. And it just, those thoughts and sounds started evoking in my mind. And then all of a sudden I saw moon, a full moon on a clear night. And then I, I was like, why are they running? And then I heard gunshot, just bang, bang, bang. And I was like, what in the world? <laughs> and it's, I mean, not that I was having like some kind of fear about my son growing up or being a father or anything like that, but I started to think to myself, why would these people be running through the corn? And then I thought, well, what if they were smuggling the Bible? And what if it was here in Indiana? And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I went back to the meeting, like a, it was a week or two later. And I, my friend, Brett Varble, who directs Disciples in the Moonlight, I turned to him and I said, hey, man, I've got this idea and I really want you to direct it. And so I laid it out for him. And he said, yeah, <laughs> he said, go write that. So I did. And I went and it took me a little bit because I'd never done it before. Uh, it took me a little bit of time. And I basically came with the first draft of the script and I gave it to him. And he said, OK, I think we have something here. And that was fall of 13. So, I mean, it's almost a, a whole year where this process is taking place. And. So he said, let's try to make it. And so we tried and we tried and we tried and it took a while. And now here we are in, in, in 2024 with the, the in theaters across the country. So it's been a long, it's been a long ride. <laughs> and it has been a long ride, but wait a second. You started it back then. Yep. When did you finish your, your filming of it? Okay. So. We wrote it in, I wrote the first couple drafts in 2014, 2015 is when we were working. We actually right. started casting in 2015 and then we didn't have any money. So we had to pull the plug. And so we kept processing, going through all these different things. And so we started shooting in 22. In the fall of 22, we shot for 25, 25 days, um, half of which were overnight. And my cast and crew are still talking to me about that one <laughs> working in the middle of the night in October in Indiana. But uh, so we finished shooting it in 22 and then we did post-production all of 23. And now here we are in 24, ready for it to hit the theaters nationwide. So, so, so let me ask you this question. How did you know that, that God was like kind of telling you to release it and, and finish it and, how did you know that 2024 was going to be the year that you needed to do this? <laughs> yeah. So it was funny. Um, during production, there were a group of us would get together on Sunday afternoons after church. We'd all go pick a restaurant in the area and we'd all go eat. And there'd be about 15 or 20 of us that would go. And then we wrapped production and everybody pretty much had gone home except for one guy. And so he and I 
went and had lunch. My boys are with me. And he said, what made you keep going? He said, you know, you guys have been working on this for a long time. I said, I know. I said, the thing of it is for me that made us keep going is that I never felt like God was saying no. Um, we believed in the concept of the idea. Uh, we believed in what, what we were doing. And it was just that it wasn't the right time. And I can't explain that other than things like money would just wouldn't come in or people that we would start to align with would start to kind of, ah, I'm going to go off this direction. I, it's not working for me. But Brett and I, and then we had a third partner, the three of us, we would meet regularly and we never got the sense that the door shut. It was just, Hey, hold on a minute, just wait. And so we were continuing this process. And I remember in, I think it was early because we shot it in the fall of 22 and in early 22, uh, Brett came to, to me and our other partner. He said, Hey, I think we ought to slash the budget. And I was like, okay, <laughs> it's not like our budget was that big to begin with. Um, but he referenced, um, God, uh, working with Gideon in the old Testament where, you know, Gideon had all these guys and he basically whittled it down to 300 and Hey, we're going to go knock out the Amalekites or the Amorites, whichever rights it was. And there was victory there. And so I was like, okay, if you think we can do it for this budget, then let's do it. And I mean, money just started coming in. Oh boy. I've never seen anything like it. And so this was probably April or May of 22. And mm -hmm. by June of 22, we were like, we're doing this. Mm -hmm. We are doing this. And then sure enough, fall, it came around. But then, then it still was, okay, we made it. Now we're getting into post-production. Now it's complete. And this was another moment where God brought um, Dave Meacham and the people at Pinnacle Peak Pictures. They brought that he was a contact that Brett had had a year prior and things just weren't right. But then he came around again. He's like, Hey, did you guys get disciples finished? As I'm, that's my paraphrase. And he said, well, we'd like to partner with you. And it, I'm telling you what, in the, in February of 24 of this year, we, we were like, okay, I think we can do it. And boom. And now it's releasing here in July. And I, I mean, it, it, when God's ready to move, he's going to move that that's really all I can say. And so it was really just us going, okay, I guess this is it. Let's go. Let's ride this wave. <laughs> I, I love that. It's been blessed like that because oh, yeah. only God can do that. Only yeah. God can move things like that. And when he want, when he says, move, move, yeah. right. Or get <laughs> out of the way is what he's trying right. to say, you know? And, and so I'm so happy to hear this. This is great. And for yeah. the people that don't really know about this movie, there is such a wonderful trailer that I'm going to put a link to at the oh, bottom great. in the description and, yes. you know, go to the link and you can see what's going on. And literally this movie is in like regal theaters this yep. week. Yeah, and, it's Regal, yeah. AMC, Cinemark. It's you, yeah, find it, go see it. <laughs> yeah. So, is there any other uh, theaters besides Regal, AMC, and Cinemark? Um, there may be, and they're they're escaping me at this moment. I know if you okay. go to if you go to fathomevents.com, um, you can type in your zip code there, and you can find a theater that's close by you, and it should pop up. And I think their radius is, I want to say, up to like forty or fifty miles. And if okay. it's not, I think you can actually uh, reach out to them and say, see if you can get it in a theater near you. So there, there are plenty of options near you. So, okay. So it would have say like, you know, I live in a small town, but mm -hmm. the town next to me has a, a movie theater. It's not playing there. If I call them up and I, re I can request it. I, as far as I know. So we had, there was a, one of our, uh, one of our crew members, she lives up in uh, Wisconsin and there was a theater in her town that didn't have it on the slate and they, called the manager and I guess a couple of them did it and it it's on the slate now. So oh. I think it's that's, I think it's that simple. I think you can call them up and say, Hey, we want to see this movie. I'm going to bring uh -huh. my friends. We're going to buy your popcorn and watch this movie. So yeah, that's, that's great to know. That yeah. is so great to know. So um, now how did you develop the character of Jake for the film? Cause that's what you play. <laughs> right. I played Jake Thornton. They, they say when you're writing, you, you should, I guess, write what you know. Um, well, I know a lot of guys like Jake Thornton. Um, I grew up with guys like that. There's elements of Jake Thornton that are in me, unfortunately, to, to some degree. 
but developing Jake, Jake is funny. Um, we had our premiere back in May and I, I was going through just kind of recapping all the events that had, had led up to that moment. And one of the things I did was I, I watched the film prior to the premiere again. I mean, I've seen it tons of times, love it every time. And I, I watched it with the script that we had. And I was like, oh man, that's changed. What so much has changed here, so much has changed there. But the story of Jake and his wife Danelle and their son Austin, that was the original core storyline throughout. And it really hasn't changed. And the thing with Jake is, is like I felt like he's somebody who's relatable. Like he struggles, he wants to do the right thing, but he struggles with how to do it. He he's clumsy. He he doesn't convey it well to his wife. His wife doesn't always understand. His wife tolerates it. But while he's trying to do this right thing, he's struggling with his day to day. He's not a great husband. He's not a great dad. Um, he's not a really even a great employee. He, you know, in one of the opening scenes, he's showing up late to work because this other thing's taking precedent. And so I felt like there are a lot of guys out there who are like him, who understand him, who, man, I just want to do the right thing, but they don't know how to do it. And I, that, so Jake kind of developed from just a lot of guys around here that I, that I know who are, who are believers, but man, they just screw up a lot. And I can attest, you know, even, even in my own marriage, like through the past, like I've wanted to do this and then I just screw it up. And my wife looks at me like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know, but yeah, Jake is, Jake is sincere. Um, he's just, sometimes he's sincerely wrong. And, uh, but he, I, I do, Jake's one of my favorites. I, I love him. So <laughs> does Jake, is he one of the, the guys that like he's smuggling the Bibles too? Absolutely. So He's so Jake has been so I'm not giving anything away when I say this, but um, uh, Brett Varvel, our director, he plays also the character of Nate Smith and Jake and Nate um, early on in the film. They are they are doing kind of um, a local smuggling operation. And so they have been together, working together on and off for a period of time. Uh, Nate is approached by a mysterious character uh, to kind of broaden their horizon, smuggle the Bible beyond just their little pocket here in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And so he brings, he brings Jake on board and that's part of the tension uh, between Jake and Donnell is Jake told Donnell he wasn't going to do it again. And now here's another job just right there. And he's going to do that as compared mm -hmm. to taking care of things at home. And so, yeah, Jake's one of the seven smugglers um, mm -hmm. who take the, the true word of God in our, in our film, we, we changed the Bible just a little bit. We call it the enlightened truth Bible. And because that's the one that's more palatable, it's more tolerant. Um, it's more acceptable, but the actual Holy Bible, the one with the punch, the one with the power is illegal. And so that's what we're trying to get into neighboring States into Illinois, Kentucky, and Ohio. And right, Jake right. jumps on board. So, well, we could use some in New Jersey. Why didn't you do that? <laughs> Well, our border <laughs> New Jersey. Maybe we'll expand out, but we got to get to Ohio first. So, <laughs> yeah. series and sequels. Right there, you go. There you go. <laughs> but but that's that's so great. But I I love that you have that kind of a relationship with your wife because you know it's true to the cause. Because think about it. You know, if you have a spouse that doesn't believe in the right. Bible as much as you do, or believe that's in true. God as much as you do, or Christ, or anything like that. There's always going to be that kind of tension in your marriage. And uh, one is always going to say, why are you doing this? Right. And I think that kind of speaks to Jake's lack of leadership as a husband and a father, because you could make the argument that if he had been doing what he was supposed to do, if he had been a, a good role model, a good leader, uh, you know, showing those spiritual characteristics in his own home, that his mm -hmm. wife probably would have been on board. But because he wasn't exhibiting those traits on a day to day or just or not the way that you're supposed to, mm -hmm. she doesn't get it. Or maybe he's trying to and she's just not in a place where God has moved her that way. And I think that a lot of families struggle with those kinds of things. And so I, that's one of the things I like about our film is that we try to portray real relationships. We try not to shy away from some of the, the struggles that people have. Yeah. Um, and I hope that people can relate to it when they see it and say, basically, how would I respond? Yeah. Well, you know, I just have to throw this in here. It is 
it isn't made in Hollywood. It's made in Indiana, but it's Hollywood style type of like film because everything is excellent. It's not like it's a, a B or a C. It's like an A. I mean, it's just a, a wonderful movie. And um, now I have to ask you if you can share any sure. behind the scene moments that are really memorable to you that either you laughed or you cried or you saw God working something Man, good. I, I, whew, uh, how long do you have? I mean, <laughs> we, it, there are so many things and we started production in pre-production production in late September, early October of 22. And I started keeping a notebook of all the things that God, that I could see that God was doing or people he had brought or moments that you can't explain any other way than what God had done. And my notebook hit 125 things. And I just stopped keeping track because I, I, I couldn't. And those are all the things that I knew about. But there are a couple moments that stand out. So early on, we were in, in pre-production. We were looking for a barn that is indicative of the state of Indiana. And around here, the, and in fact, in the barn we found, the only thing that was missing was a basketball hoop. It had everything else. But we were looking for this, this one barn. We couldn't find it, just couldn't find it. And But I was also in charge of helping find housing for our cast and crew who were coming into town. And I was looking for one more place to find, to stash one of our people. And my wife, who was helping me with it, she said, just hold on a minute. Before you go and book a hotel or do this or just just wait, maybe the, you know maybe there's something out there. Maybe God's got something. I was like, okay. So our third partner, he came to me. He said, hey, I was at somebody's birthday party the other night, and he said, and they have this little apartment in this barn or in this like garage. Do you want to check it out? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it's a garage in rural Indiana. How good could it really be? He goes, no, it's great. It's great. So I went out and looked at it. And it was spectacular. This guy had re had renovated this one corner because his dad was staying with him for a period of time and he wanted it to be nice. So I'm like, yeah, we'll take it. So the owner of the property, he said, well, hey, do you want to take a tour around the place? I was like, sure, why not? And he had this huge acreage out in, um, in North Central Indiana or Hendricks County. And so I just started touring with him. And all of a sudden we come up on this barn and I said, Jeff, Hold on a second. So I took pictures of the barn. I went back to, to Brett and I said, Brett, I think I found a barn. He goes, let's go look at it right now. So not only that, so there's the scene where we needed to, and you've seen it in the trailers where, where we're driving a pickup truck through a cornfield. Yes. We needed a cornfield adjacent to a barn. The barn had a cornfield, not even 20 yards from it. And the owner of the property, he leased the farmland. And he talked to the farmer who, who farmed it and said, yeah, that's actually the very last field that I'm going to plow because of the weather that happened back in the spring. I was late to plant that field. And I was like, what? And then Jeff said, well, yeah, do that. Do whatever you want. Oh, and hey, here's a trailer that you guys can use to do this. Here's a four wheeler, four by four ah. that you can use to do this. And I'm telling you what, like. That stood out to me because it was one thing that we needed, but God gave us like six, like even to the detail of the weather back in March, April, and May. And we're here in, in, in October or late September, October, which is normally harvest season around here. And yeah. this one was like, no, we're going to wait. And I was like, man, and, and that's just one story. I, I can, I have dozens of others. But it, it's it, it never this project uh, above all else, like I've seen God work in my life throughout my, the years of my life. I mean, but you just see little small little things, little glimpses here and there. But this one was just like a big, hey, you want to see how good I am? Here's how good I am. And it was just bang, 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 just one after another. And it was I mean, I, I, I could go on and on. <laughs> but I, like I, I said, my notebook was 125 things of what God did. I love this. You know, I, which leads me to ask you, what, what is your relationship with Christ? I mean, how did you come to Christ? What is your walk like? So that some of the viewers need to know a little bit about you. Sure. So my, I grew up in a, a Christian home. Uh, my parents are believers. Um, my grandparents were believers and uh, well, my mother's, so my, my mom's dad, my grandfather on, on her side, 
Um, he was a medical missionary uh, back in the 50s and 60s. He was over in India for a period of time, just helping with a clinic over there, just in the shadow of the Himalayas. And so I grew up with faith like that was never I mean, it was just that's what we did. We on church on Sunday, we went to church once around here. It was Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, all of it. And I remember when I was about, I want to say seven years old, um, we were, I was just in a Sunday school class, you know, like you do. And uh, I remember not a lot of the details, but I do remember our teacher. We were in this little pocket room in this old, old building. I mean, I think this building was built like in like the 1880s or something. I mean, it was old, but I remember sitting in there and basically the, the short version was, Hey, you know, do you want to be saved? And it was a, one of those moments where I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I need that. And I mean, I was only seven, but man, I, I did, I'd done some things <laughs> as a seven year old, but, and then I think about a week or two later, um, we had baptism. And so I, I, I got up in front of our church body and, and was baptized. And so then it became, it became just kind of this progress of faith with ebbs and flows. Um, I remember, I remember when my high school years trying to, you know, like, like you do when you're a teenager trying to figure out, okay, the next step of my life, what, what am I doing when I leave high school? Am I getting a job? Am I going to college? What does that look like? And I remember praying, okay, Lord, I don't, I don't, I don't know where my next steps are. And I've always been the kind of a person who's a bit of a wanderer. Um, I don't like, it's not that I get bored. It's just like, I, maybe, or maybe I do, but I just kind of moved from like, I've had several different jobs throughout the course of my life. And, but I remember in high school looking at the, the few skills that I had and my, the thing that my parents always kind of hammered into my skull uh, was whatever you do, whatever it is, make sure you do it for God's glory and you'll be blessed no matter what it is. And so I, I tried to take that tone. And so then I, after high school, I went to college, I went to a Christian college in Ohio. Um, and it was, again, it was kind of more seeking the same thing. And, and so I got to, I remember the pivotal moment though, for me, was in 1998. I was a junior in college. I was at Cedarville. It was at the time it was called Cedarville College. Now it's Cedarville University. And it's a great, it's a great institution there in Southwest Ohio. And I was living off campus at the time. And my dad called me and he said, Hey, his father had just passed away. And I remember thinking to myself, man, this is different. Because my one of my, my grandmother had passed away back in, in when I was in high school, but she had suffered from a long bout of cancer. And so it was kind of unexpected and even in its sadness, but it was, it was expected. And, but my, my other grandfather passing away, it kind of changed my perspective on things. And so I went into that, my senior year with that kind of in the back of my head. And at the time, I think Cedarville's kind of changed their structure a little bit, but at the time they had summer or they had, uh, ministry teams that would travel throughout the country. And one of the teams was a drama team. And I had done some theater and stuff in high school. And I think I I'd even done a play or two at the university, but I remember going into that audition thinking, man, I'd really like to serve the Lord with the talents that I have. I just, I hope maybe this is it. And I had, I had auditioned for this team my freshman year flopped spectacularly. It was great, <laughs> but I go, so I, I did the first round of auditions and I got called back. And I remember talking to the director who I still occasionally speak to his name's Brandon Waltz. And he, he's one of my favorite people and he's had a spectacular impact on my life. But I remember sitting in there and he said, why do you want to be on this team? And I said, I'll be honest with you, Brandon. I, I, I said, the thing for me is I just feel like I need to be serving the Lord with the talents that I have. And whether that's with this team or somewhere else, that's what I intend to do my senior year. And okay. So I made that team and we, so then I'm getting into the weeds here. So I apologize if I'm boring, but I come to the end of my senior year and we travel during the summertime. And I felt like God was calling me to go to seminary. And so I did. And, and we, we visited Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. 
And I was like, yeah, I think this is where God wants me to be. And so that's where I really, that, that school uh, is where I first took like an actual intentional writing class, but it f- transformed my life. Each step of the way has been, okay, God, what do you have for me? What, what can I do? Like I, I've told people in the past, um, when I was growing up, I was a, and still am, I'm a big fan of the St. Louis Cardinals. And there was a, they had an infielder, uh, back when I was growing up, his name was Jose Akendo. And he was kind of a utility infielder. He played every position. And I always thought he was really cool because he would play all these positions. And I've told people, I said, I feel like I'm kind of like a utility infielder. There's not one thing that I'm great at, but there's a bunch of different things that I can do. And I feel like the thing that I've tried to do is say, God, whatever it is you want me to do, I'm willing to lean into. I don't don't have like a, a career per se, like a track. Like it's funny that, because Brett has known he's wanted to be a filmmaker since he's like five years old. And for me, film wasn't even on my radar really until this project came up. Like I just watched movies, but I was like, okay, it's not really what I do, but like I had a variety of interests, but I feel like God has used each one of those interests to, to glorify him. And so I just kind of, when this project came up, I kind of reached back into that bag. And I remember this thing when I was 10 years old, my mom and dad, They got me a kid's comic book um, and it was called God Smuggler. And it was about um, a guy named Brother Andrew. He was in uh, Europe. I think it was in, I want to say like the 50s or 60s. And he was smuggling Bibles into communist parts of Europe. And I remember being fascinated by that as a kid. And then I just took, I was like, you know, and then I tried to apply some of those same principles to this story. Like, what would it look like? Because you don't think about it now. Like, parts of Europe, like, eh, okay, you can do that. But they were actually smuggling it through, you know, through the iron curtain. And it's so to go back all the way when I was seven to see how God has pulled, kind of dragged me along. And so the things that my parents instilled into me, my grandparents instilled into me, um, that's a long, that's a long winded answer just to say, God's been doing some things. And, and, and then, you know, recently the things like, my wife and I, our marriage has grown stronger because of the things that God has done. Uh, we're trying to teach our boys, kind of put that importance. Hey, the Bible is the truth. Like when, when you're in hopeless situations, when you're in despair, uh, when things aren't going how you thought they would, turn to God's word because there is hope there. There's promise. There's It may not be the answer you want, but there is hope there for you. Yeah. Well, from what I'm hearing you say, it's been like a dropping of seeds along your path as Absolutely. your life went along. And and that dropping of the seed of the God smuggling, yeah. that really took root. God needed you to okay. see that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that, t- so that today you could release this movie and that people could really, it could resonate with people. So my, my next question is, is what kind of, you know, what do you, what kind of people, how does this resonate with the audience and sure. what kind of people are going to be watching this? So when Brett and I first got together uh, to work, we basically both said, we're going to do this project, you know, no matter what I told him, I said, look, man, I, I want to write a movie that uh, the, a story that I want to see. Um, and this story is full of action. It's full of suspense there's some humor peppered in there. Um, there are real life situations, but it's the kind of movie that I like. And there's some fine faith-based movies out there. And, but I've found that a lot of those movies don't appeal to, they don't really appeal to guys like me. And I, there's just, those are the, the kind of movies that I like. I like, and this, the core of this movie is that it's a heist film. So if you like movies like Ocean's 11, things like that, then it, it it's right up your alley. And so, I think that this is a movie really for everyone. Um, you know, I, I say that, well, it's, it's a guy's movie and it, like, I love this and that, but the women of our film, I mean, they sparkle, they make, they, they give this story depth and character and heart. And like, just off the top of my head, like the, the woman who plays my wife, Danelle, her name's Stephanie Parker, spectacular actor. Uh, Michael Lynn Hansen, who plays opposite um, Brett, she plays Rachel Smith, Nate's wife. 
she's spectacular. Uh, Bailey Tony plays um, uh, Ashley Edwards. Um, our first AD, Carrie Fabian, she makes a small cameo. Um, one of our producers, Sharon Oliphant, she makes a small cameo. And we've we've said that this can be actually it can be a date night movie. Um, it may you may not seem like it, but there there is there's relationship here. There's love. There's hope. And I think it's an I think it's the kind of movie that it can be. There's something in there for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you can find yourself in there or you can even at least go, man, how would I respond if that were my reality? So mm -hmm. I think that's who could go see it. Everybody, everyone. <laughs> yes. Yes. And um, what kind of a message do you hope viewers will take away from the disciples in the moonlight? So the, the pre, so we did our premiere back May 9 um, here in Indianapolis. And then we did two additional screenings out at one of the theaters out here in Hendricks County out in Danville. And it was, we opened it up more to kind of like, it was a kind of a, a smaller, but public audience. And the responses that came out were the responses that we hoped, which was several people said to us, I, when I get home, I want to just grab onto my Bible. Um, we wanted people to see the importance of God's word, see how it can be transformative. Um, we wanted to, as Brett has said many, many times, we want to lift high the word of God. And I think that, I think that we've done that in, in our limited human capacity. We've shown how precious it can be. We've shown that it, it does have the power to change lives. And that's what I hope people leave with, because I know throughout the course of my life, um, various passages of scripture have been hugely impactful. Uh, they've been healing moments when I've needed them, challenges when I needed them. And I hope that people will walk away. And if, you've if you're one of these people, like if you're an unbeliever, like if you don't call yourself a Christian, maybe this would cause you to kind of go, hmm, I've heard about the Bible, but what is it? What, what is it? How, why is it? Why is it such a big deal? Why are these people making such a big deal? Why are the characters in this film risking their lives for just a, a book that's thousands of years old? So I hope that it will challenge people to go to it and read it. That's the big hope. Well, to find out more about Josh, you can go to IMDb, Instagram or Facebook. Um, but to get tickets for the movie, which starts today, July 17th, and it's going to run through the 24th. Right. And let's hope it goes beyond that. That's our prayer. Much further. Much further. <laughs> much further. Go to disciplesinthemoonlightmovie.com or you can go to fathomevents.com. And um, just that last word, what would you like to leave my audience with today? You said so much before, but I really do think that there's something in your heart you would like to pour into someone's soul. So the, the thing that I've always tried to put in anything that I've written, uh, any performance that I've given, any project that I've been a part of is there's a, a line that kind of came to me many, many years ago. And the line is this, there's hope. There is always hope. And that's not just meant to be just kind of some platitude that you're like, ah, whatever. No, the hope that, and my wife and I were talking about this the other night, the hope is Jesus. The hope is what he has done. The hope is his sacrifice and, and the life that he has for us, even beyond here on earth. And so there is hope. There is always hope. And you can find it if you've never done it. You can find it in the pages of the Bible. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts on our conversation by putting your comments below and visit the call with nancycebedo.com to learn more about me and what we do here on the ministry. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share. Your support means so much to us.